In this video, we're going to take a look at a special type of stereo isomer called an optical isomer. So optical isomers are a type of configurational isomer. And if we're reminding ourselves, stereo isomers themselves always have the same connectivity, but the atoms are arranged differently in space. So let's just hop right into this and see what these optical isomers are all about. So let's start out with a definition. Optical isomers occur when you have a carbon atom and that carbon atom is attached to four different atoms or groups. And what we would say then is that carbon atom is chiral or it has a chiral center. So there's a couple of sort of ways that are kind of describing this particular carbon. They are mirror images of each other, and the individual optical isomers are called enantiomers. So this example here, just really, really basic. The black is the carbon, and if it's joined to four other groups, so we've got cyan, we've got green, we got magenta and red, then this would be one enantiomer here, and this is the other enantiomer. And so we would say that these are mirror images of each other, but if we tried to place them on top of each other, they are not superimposable. So that's what makes an optical isomer an optical isomer. So let's take a couple of, look at a couple of examples and go, okay, well, now that we know what optical isomers are, how do we identify where the chiral carbon is and how do we draw the different enantiomers? So let's maybe start with the example on the right here because I think this is a little bit easier to sort of see. And what you're gonna do is just kind of take a look at each carbon and ask yourself, is it attached to four different things? This first carbon here is attached to three hydrogens, and then you would count this whole thing as another group. Because it's got three hydrogens and only one other different group, that carbon is certainly not chiral. Doesn't fit the definition. All right, if we take a look then at the next carbon here, then it is attached to one group here, and it's hydrogen here, this ethyl group here, and a hydroxyl group. Now, those are four different things. We've got a methyl, we've got an ethyl, a hydroxyl, and a hydrogen. So this carbon is chiral. Quite often, it's denoted with a little star to say that it's the chiral carbon. If we're gonna draw then the two enantiomers, the easiest way to do this is to take the groups and we're gonna draw, um, usually we kind of condense down these, uh, these ethyl groups. So I'm gonna go CH2 and then CH3 here. And then I'll do one wedge coming out for the one hydrogen. And then I'm gonna put the methyl group here. And really to do the enantiomer, is we're just gonna flip this diagram around. So we're gonna leave the OH going up here, but instead of the straight line going out the one way, we're gonna make it go this way. Gonna run out of room here, but that's okay. And then we're gonna draw the wedge there, and then the dash coming this way. So those would be mirror images of each other. Now, I won't draw the other enantiomers for the next one, but let's just kind of take a look at our carbons here. Uh, this first carbon on the chain has three hydrogens attached, so that's definitely not chiral. Uh, anything with a double bond is not going to be chiral either because it doesn't have four different things attached to it. It only has three things attached to it, so it really doesn't fit that definition. So our chiral carbons here, because it's attached to this carboxyl group, a hydrogen, a methyl group, and a hydroxyl group. So this carbon would be chiral. Now one really unique property about optical isomers is if you put it into something called a polarimeter, and I'll go over what this is in a second, but uh, its main property is that it's going to take the 
plain polarized light and it's going to rotate it. Um, and depending on which enantiomer we have, it might rotate it to the left or it might rotate it to the right. So you're probably asking yourself, like, what the heck is a polarimeter and what is plain polarized light and what is Dr. J talking about? So let's kind of go over the basics here. We've got a light source. And when you have light coming from a light source, we say that it's unpolarized. And what that really means is it's just going in any which old direction it wants to. Okay. Uh, we can take a polarizer. So polarizers basically have these slits and it will polarize the light into a single plane. So it's only in this picture kind of going up and down. All right. And then you can put that in and shine that through a sample holder. And if there's an optically active isomer in there, it'll take this plane, so if it's going up or down, it'll actually rotate it to one side or the other. So you can see it's kind of rotated here. And with an analyzer, you're able to figure out what that particular angle is. You don't really need to know too many details about how this works, but essentially you would put a sample in here with just your solvent. And then you would set this up so that you're spinning this polarizer until no particular light can be seen. Uh, that means that the two polarizers are gonna be exactly perpendicular to each other and stopping the light. So that's kind of just setting it up. And then the second run you would do is a solvent plus your sample. And again, you would rotate this polarizer until there was no light again. And then you would take the angle difference. And then the angle difference is gonna tell you which way it's rotating the light. So one of the isomers will rotate it left, one will rotate it right. And another thing we kinda of need to know about is that you can have something called a racemic mixture. So when you have equimolar mixture of two enantiomers and you put this into a polarimeter, basically what you see is no rotation of the plane polarized light. And that's because they cancel each other out. So they're gonna rotate the light to the left and then to the right, the exact same amount. And so the overall effect is that there is no effect on the plane polarized light. And so they're gonna appear optically inactive. And as we get a bit further in organic chemistry, you're gonna see there are some reactions that will produce both optical isomers. And so if you were to take this reaction and the, the products and then put it in a polarimeter, it would look like there's nothing that's optically active because you have a racemic mixture. So just kind of one interesting sort of fact to know to kind of keep at the back of your mind, uh, cause we will kind of come back to that a little bit later on in another video. Finally, the last sort of term we need is diastereoisomers. These are stereoisomers that are not mirror images of each other. They can arise, or they do include cis-trans isomers, uh, so because they are not optical or mirror images of each other. But the other uh, one that sort of arises is if you have two or more chiral centers and they differ in configuration at at least one of the centers. So in this particular molecule here, we have chiral carbons here and here in both of these. But you can see in one, we've got the bromine going up and the OH going down in both of them. But then in the next one here, it differs with the CH3 going back there and up there and the hydroxyl group going up there and back there. So these two are the same, but these two are different, which means that these are diastereoisomers. So that was a lot of information. We talked about optical isomers and antiomers. We talked about plain polarized light and polarimeters, as well as racemic mixtures and diastereoisomers, which was a lot. Uh, so that's it then for this video. We'll see you in the next one.